right, good afternoon. I'm just going to make a quick overview of the F5 and 55 version 2.0 and talk about what's new and some of the highlights. But before I uh, move any further, I want to remind you, we have did something unique this time when we launched this camera. We told everyone we fixed the price, we're not charging for updates, and we told everyone what the update path would be so they would know what the capabilities would be of the cameras all along. And all these things that appear on these charts are major changes, but we do many minor ones that are not included in these charts. And we've been keeping pretty tight to the schedule. I just want to remind that the previous version 1.20, which then got updated to 1.22, added one very important capability, which is SR file compression. And SR file is actually HCCAM SR that is recorded to a memory, not to tape, but it's the same quality. And we have SQ mode, 440 megabits per second, 422 10-bit. And also a new mode, 440 megabits per second, RGB, 444, 10-bit as well. And we've added a new mode, which is SR Lite, 220 megabits, 422 10-bit. So 220 megabits is very similar to the bit rates that you would find ProRes, or DNX HD, but the SR compression is MPEG-4 Studio Profile, which is incredibly high quality. It's actually uh, visually lossless at the uh, 440 megabits per second. The original SR recorders could go up to 880 megabits per second, but this bitrate was never really used for movie making. So uh, all these very high quality recordings for blockbuster movies were always done at 400 megabits per second because it's visually lossless. So this is a major development that happened. We've had this almost a month now. Uh, some of the biggest movies, uh, Avatar is the biggest grossing movie of all, was recorded using SR. And many feature films have been used and also for prime time television production. So let's move on to what's new with uh, version 2.0. The most important thing is that we finally have high frame rate recording and 2K resolution and using the full super 35 millimeter scan. This means that there's no loss of angle of view. So when you're shooting 2K, we're not cropping the image. Some other competitive cameras, when you select 2K, it actually then switches over to only see a tiny bit in the middle of the image and the image becomes very telephoto and it degrades in quality. So we are going to add super 16 millimeter scan in the December build, which we're calling 3.0. So this is also a major development. Film schools or documentary shooters, they're all very excited about this. This is an excellent capability, film schools especially own many super 16 millimeter lenses because until a couple of years ago or even last year, they were still shooting super 16 millimeter film. So being able to repurpose these lenses is a very major thing for them. So XABC at 2K, the base recording frame rates, these are the frame rates that you can record and then it will play back at these frame rates. 2398, we've added 24P, 25, 2997, 50, and 5994. And at high frame rate, we have 120 frames per second. And this will go all the way up to 180 frames per second in the December build. And the F5 has now been upgraded to record up to 180 frames per second as well. So both the F5 and 55 will have this capability in that version 3.0. We can record 2K 16-bit linear raw to the R5 now at 2398, 24, 25, 2997, 50, and 5994. And it can record high frame rate at 120, 180, and 240 frames per second. So this means 
that if the camera is cranking at 240 frames per second and you're recording at 24p or 2398, you have 10 times reduction in slow motion. So this adds a lot of drama to the scene. And very interesting, it is possible to shoot 120 frames per second raw and simultaneously 120 frames per second XABC to SBIS cards. So the dual recording is supported. And finally, we've added 24p recording to 4K RAW. So 4K RAW can crank up to 60 frames per second, but pure 24p was not available, only 23.98. So now we have at 2K and at 4K, we've added 24p capability. And at XAVC 422, we've added also 24p. Of course, this is for F55 only, because only the F55 can record 4K internal. Other functionalities is user gamma. Gamma is a really important part of the uh, expressive tools that the uh, filmmakers have or the production people have. And it is possible to create your own gamma curves. We have tools like the CVP uh, gamma editor, but most people will gravitate towards, uh, there are companies that actually create custom gamma curves. And it is possible then to load these gamma curves into the camera and have your own unique look or use it for your own unique project, something that you really need to show in a certain way. It is very simple to do. You just copy the gamma curve to an SD card and then you load it into the camera. We've added simultaneous 2K RAW HD and MPEG-50 simultaneously, and I just mentioned about XAVC and the high frame rate. Enable audio time code and the sub-display button and the rotary encoder for audio level adjustment. And we've enabled file sub-display button for lens files and so on. Cabrio lenses are supported. This is very important. We are able to start-stop the recording process by pressing the record button on the Cabrio lens. And it's also possible to control the iris and the zoom and the focus via the RM controller. All of these things are supported. We have simultaneous output from SDI. The total four outputs are enabled. We've added waveform and histogram to the uh, viewfinder and the SDI3 when we have the overlay. It is possible to see uh, the waveform monitor or the histogram overlaid and uh, record review of the SBIS card. We're adding support for the new XQD memory card, the new Z100 camcorder, the little Handycam 4K Handycam camera, uses exclusively XQD memory cards. This is a fantastic new type of memory that Sony has developed. It's not a proprietary, this is part of a standard, and there are other manufacturers that are supporting it. And it has uh, many advantages over SD cards. In October, there's going to be a new 64 gigabyte QDN64 is the model. And this one will be suitable for MPEG-2 only. This uh, released in October. And uh, QDS, so the cards with the S designation, are much faster transfer speeds. 64 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte as well. Even 4K at up to 600 megabits per second. So these are all totally supported. For those of you who are not familiar, this is what the card looks like. It's small, it's larger than an SD card, but smaller than a S by S. It fits into an Express 34 adapter. Sony makes all of these. And there is also an inexpensive USB 3 reader for the card that functions very well. I've tested this and it works magnificently. You can use this memory with this system exclusively and replace S by S entirely. Many people are using SD cards. SD cards are not very reliable. If you've ever looked at the backside of an SD card, you see that it has these little patches that are gold 
This is actually gold metal. And when you put the card into the device, it is just these little thin wires, the little fingers are pressing against these little pads. So if there's any kind of vibration or any kind of force that happens while you're shooting, these pins will vibrate off and will lose contact and you will lose the recording. And you know how Sony can recover data from the card, so sometimes the, the camera will tell you that the card was corrupted and that you want to salvage it. With SD cards, this is not possible. When you put a Sony card, like a S by S, or a XQD card onto the camera, the camera talks to the card controller uh, there is a special CPU inside the card, and that has its own software. And it optimizes the card for the recording with very high reliability. And we have a scheme to detect if the file wasn't closed properly or if there was some other kind of issue where the camera will recover it. We're also adding these capabilities to some of the applications. So the last visit that we had to Japan, we asked them to implement this, and now RoViewer and the new utility are able to recover cards as well. So this is a very welcome thing. So you don't need to use a camera to recover. And just going back to the connector, the connector in the XUD card is pretty similar to what the S by S connector is. So you know how reliable that is. So it's a beam on post type connector, and those cards just never fail. Another major improvement that we had talked about, something that I've been waiting for a long time, was that on the sub-display on the side of the camera, we were only able to use the camera button and the view button, uh, but not everything was implemented. And file and audio timecode buttons, the two in the middle, were not active at all. In uh, version 2.0, these buttons are now fully implemented, and we do have the ability to adjust many things from the side. So let's take a look. So this is the base setting when you're in the camera mode. You have the gamma, the sensitivity, SNQ, frame rate, the shutter, and the color temperature. The audio indication is always there, and of course we have the time code, the frame rate, the uh, recording format, the battery, and so on. If you press the camera button once more, now we have this new screen. And in this screen, it is possible then to, using the buttons that are above and below the display, to simply push that to select either color bars or to enable the SDI display on. It is possible to recall scene files. So here we have the screen for file. If you press file, the first screen you're gonna see is for scene recall. So if you have saved different configurations for different locations or different shots that you're working on onto the camera, it is possible to quickly recall these without having to go into the menu. So this really accelerates the pace. This is very welcome for fast-paced television production. It is also possible to recall lens files. The camera can identify, so we do have the Kokai and Ari LDS, and if the camera identifies a lens and it knows which lens it's talking to when it's connected, it will automatically load the proper lens files. So. Uh, it will automatically compensate for chromatic aberration or other characteristics of the lens that is being utilized at the moment. And when you switch lenses, it will simply recognize the next lens if it also has one of those interfaces, the Kokai or the Ari LDS, and it will then automatically reconfigure itself for the next lens. But let's say that you're using a lens that doesn't have electronic uh, communication with the camera. It is possible for you to create your own lens files, and we provide a very sophisticated series of parameters that you can adjust to make everything perfect, including uh, some lenses, the uh, centering is not correct, and we can even compensate for that. So 
horizontal and vertical and so on. So, so this screen allows you to recall these files. Uh, if the audio button is pressed, this will be the first screen you will see. It has the reference level, which is towards the left for both channel one and channel two on the bottom. And then in this case, I set channel two on the bottom to be manually adjusted, and then you see a plus minus zero. And just by turning that little rotary dial on the side of the camera, you can change the audio level. And of course, we do have on the right hand side the audio level meters, and we can adjust that and see that real time. And in the top, um, uh, channel one here is currently configured for auto, which is like an AGC. And if you press the audio timecode button once more, then it shows you the monitor level. Monitor means the headphone output. And you can adjust the level and you can adjust what you're hearing, if it's channel one or channel two independently or channel one and two together or channel three, channel four, and so on. So all of those combinations are available and very, very useful and powerful functionality. Uh, the camera, if you press the audio timecode button once more, then it goes into the timecode scene. So we brought the audio to the top layer because it's something that we assume that people need to adjust very often. And timecode is something that you adjust only once, so you got to keep pressing the button to get down to this page. Uh, once you get down to this page, you can set everything about the timecode, whether it's record run or free run or is preset or if it's jamming all of these things are available and whether if it's a drop frame or not drop all of those things are available let's talk a little bit about high frame rate so we have the 2k raw up to 120 180 and 240 frames per second we've had several tests that have been done with the beta version of the cameras and the results are truly extraordinary. The picture quality is very beautiful, and it is possible to achieve some very creative stuff with the cameras. So we're hoping to post something for you very soon. When we're shooting super slow motion, we're using something called pixel binning. And because of the pixel binning scheme, in some instances, the quality of the image will be a little bit less than just shooting a straight 4K. And we've come up with a new optical low-pass filter that can be easily changed in the field. It takes less than two minutes to do it. And this can be put on the camera very easily by the operator. So it is designated, it has a indicator on it, stamped on it, and the camera knows which filter you have on. It detects it and it shows it on the status display which filter you have on. The Lopez filter is not a must-have. Quite frankly, the results of using this filter is just a softening of the image. If you have something that has a lot of fine detail, it's going to make everything look a lot smoother. It's going to be what our competitors at ARRI call a more organic image. <laughs> so if you shoot in 4K mode with the optical low pass, it's going to make everything look very soft. Uh, some people love that, so this is, here's an opportunity to express themselves, if that's what they want. And it reduces uh, motion judder if you're panning, because the image is blurred more, softer, it's not as noticeable. So this is how you change the filter, there's a tiny little screw in the top right corner, you don't take it out. You're just losing it just one turn, and you can slide the filter to the side, and just without putting your fingers on the glass, take out the filter and put it in the container, and put the other filter in the camera without getting any dust on it. And here's the status screen. If you look at the bottom corner, you see it says optical filter, and you can see this is 4K. So this is actually then, uh, if this had the 2K filter on, it will then say 2K here. Please notice that there is a focal length indicator here, and there's also a focus distance as well. 
So the camera has like six different status pages. This is a similar status page that we were seeing here from my computer screen a minute ago. And if I turn the rotary, the little dial on the side of the camera, the first time it clicks, I'm looking at the audio status and we can see the audio level meters with even the DV indicators, the source and the reference level, all the information that you need. It shows the system status, which is the frame rate you're shooting at, what is the resolution, which gamma you're using, which is the record format, if you're recording or not. There's oodles and oodles of information. What the SDI outputs are doing, so here's SDI one through four, and what is being output via all of these, and what's on the HDMI, and the test output. The bottom of line is says uh, test, and then it says HD, why? But this now, you can change the what comes out of the test output. It can be composite. We had a lot of people ask us for this when we first came out with the camera a year ago. So those guys will be very happy to hear that we can do this now. I have nothing assigned, but if I had anything assigned, you could see it here on this assignable button page. This has a battery status. It shows even the manufacturing date of the battery. In the media, how many minutes you got remaining, and then gigabytes, and uh, we're back to the camera page. So it's pretty powerful. Since the uh, F5 and 55 came out, you know, the design of this camera was to provide these beautiful ergonomics and the ability to be operated with virtually any lens. Being able to use any optical system or any lens uh, provides the greatest amount of creativity because in the end the purpose of the camera is just to capture with uh, as much fidelity as possible whatever the lens that is bolted onto it projects onto the image sensor. And here's an image that you're probably familiar with is uh, 55 with the uh, Antinu Optimo Rouge lens and David is operating the camera with a uh, little wooden hand grip. And now there are several hand grips in the market that have buttons to start and stop the camera. So if you're not aware of this, this is something really important. So Volcas, 16 bar 9, and many other companies have that. So you just press that little red button on top of the hand grip and you can then start and stop the camera. And here's uh, again the camera now with the Fujinon Cabrio lens, and it just operates just like an ANG lens. You can start stop the camera with your thumb, you can zoom with uh, operating the zoom rocker. The camera doesn't have a video input, the lens has a return video, so we are assigning a functionality. The return video is becoming now an assignable button. And there'll be several things that'll be assigned to it. One of them is expanded focus, which is a quite obvious uh, use of this button, or less clip review and a number of other things. So about 10 different things that we'll be able to assign to the button. I just want to say the interoperability with the lens is now fully electronic. We can see the indication of the lens metadata on the viewfinder for iris, zoom, and focus. And that is being recorded real time onto the SBIS cards or the raw media. And it can be viewed as metadata using our applications. So this is important. Especially, we are able to record the binary data. Uh, the F55 will be able to record the binary data from the Cook lenses and this is a very powerful feature for VFX. So if you're making special effects for movie creation or for high-level commercials, it's very easy to track shots and to create interoperability between the footage shot with the camera and the computer renderings for the animation. We have the what we call an FZ mount, and it has a hot shoe. And this is how the camera communicates with other lenses, with lenses that have electronic capability. 
And of course, this mount is very, very robust, and again, it's very shallow flange. So this allows us to put virtually any lens on it. The camera does come with a PL mount adapter, which we're all familiar with, and it can talk to Cook Eye or Ari LDS uh, lenses that have used either of those protocols. I just want to mention that you know Sony extended the Cook Eye protocol, and when we did so, we added a lot of functionality via this interface, other than just knowing where the entrance pupil is on the lens or what the uh, depth of field is or all that information that lenses normally provide. We added like start stop and zoom and all these other capabilities that were not in the original protocol. And this is uh, how we can talk to the cabrio lens. Even through the using an RB170, you can control the lens uh, remotely. We have a new PL mount adapter that we're introducing. This PL mount adapter is uh, identical to the one that is shipped with the camera, except that it has a 12-pin interface. This adapter will be very desirable for people who own before lens adapters they can put this adapter on the camera and then plug their B4 lens into the 12-pin connector. The camera will communicate with the lens and it will power the lens and everything through this. So it will really clean up and simplify the system. As I mentioned, we're able to use many different lenses and uh, here's an example of a vintage lens, a BNCR lens, this is a very old maybe 40 year old. These are the kind of lenses that Stanley Kubrick would use for films like with Sophia Loren. And of course there are more modern lenses that we want to use with the camera as well. And here are three adapters. The leftmost one is the Optitech CPLI adapter that we've been shipping with the F5 kits until now. And this enables the use of Canon EF lenses. The adapter in the center is also made by Optitech and is a Nikon adapter. And this adapter has both positive lock and it allows the lens to operate without clicking. So you just turn the ring and you can turn the iris just like if it were a film lens. Uh, the adapter to the right of that, of course, is a PL that comes with it. And there's a PL mount lens just as a reference. So the, just to put things into perspective, the Nikon lens that is in the middle, that's a 50 millimeter f1.2 lens. And see how tiny it is. And the one on the right is a 40 millimeter Pancake 2.8 Canon. So this shows the optional Optitron adapter. You don't have to use this, but if you do use this, you're able to control the Canon lenses better than Canon can. With the Optitron, this uh, looks like a follow focus, and it is a follow focus. Typically, the DSLR lenses, the focus ring, has a very limited amount of rotation. This means that you turn it a little bit and it makes big changes and it's very hard to focus. And this is one of the reasons that DSLR shooters have a lot of trouble focusing and a lot of the shots are defocused. If you use the Optitron, the Optitron provides almost 240 degree rotation of the follow focus wheel. And so it spreads up the focus over a larger rotation and it makes it a lot easier to control and more precisely. So this, it turns these DSLR lens into almost like a cine lens, the same kind of rotation a cine lens has. And there's a tiny little red knob here shown on the top and this slides front to back. And this actually controls the aperture. Normally we use a little buttons on the side of the Optitech, but if you use the Optitron, you just slide this forwards and back. And also, it controls the lens with very high resolution. Some of these Canon lenses can be adjusted in quarter stop increments, and this is very possible to do with this system. It works very well. Uh, these things have been working, uh, you know, other than some teething 
issues we had originally, uh, they're bulletproof. They're very reliable. We have a new system. The old system required you to have wires to power it. The new one doesn't require the wires. Some of the dealers that received the new Optitech in the package called us because they, were, they thought that they were missing the wires. But then they were very happy to know that the camera now powers the lens and the Optitech system. And the camera can see the lens aperture and the zoom position and the focus position and the viewfinder. So all of those things are displayed. And so it's a very high degree of interoperability. Uh, the system can be updated to provide wireless connectivity and you can control it from your smartphone. Let's say an iPhone or an iPad or a Sony phone. This is an image of Andy Young. Some of you have probably seen him before and uh, at NAB. He shot some beautiful stuff for us with the FS700. Andy Young has shot an awful lot of Super 16. And he's a world-known nature-type cinematographer. He just uh, did a film that was nominated for four Emmys. He has a classic image of himself holding a... Atom XDR Super 16 millimeter camera, which is considered the most ergonomic and the most comfortable camera in the world. And uh, he visited a couple of weeks ago. We were talking. I was showing him the camera configured with a wooden handle and the Canon lens. And we were talking. And he grabbed the camera and he put it on his shoulder. He was just talking with the camera on his shoulder. And it's a very classic photo of him and other people like Al Maisels holding Canon XDRs in the same way. So I grabbed my phone and took a picture right away. So that's, that's what it's all about, that we have managed to make a system, a camera system that is very comfortable to use. And uh, talking about having uh, flexibility and working for documentary, here is the LA for lens adapter, FZ or FZ for the Sony mount, B, one, this is the first two-thirds inch lens adapter for the F5 and 55 system. And this is an image of the with a nice Canon lens and uh, the adapter. And you can see how well it sits on the camera head. And it's actually possible to slide the camera even further back and slide the viewfinder further out to make it even more comfortable to operate. And the lens connects to the camera via the 12-pin connector, just as if it were an F800 or an FS700. It, it just works. It's just the same. There's no loss of angle of view. The quality is very good. It is very fast, very little to any optical distortion. And it doesn't weigh a lot. Price under $6,000, which is very reasonable. And especially because it provides a 12-pin connector. Other adapters in the market, they're similarly priced, and there's no way to power or communicate directly from the camera. So we're providing that capability. This is unique for now, at least, Sony. So when we use the Sony adapter, we can start stop from the lens. We control via the remote control. We have the lens information. We can use the CBK DCB01. The return video button is also assignable. And we provide chromatic aberration compensation. This is what is known as ALAC. And we have ALAC2. So we have chromatic aberration compensation in both the horizontal and the vertical axis. There are several lenses that are on the database at the moment. And we continue to add lenses to the database. Just want to note that Auto Iris will be available in the December build. There is a second lens adapter, which is the LAFZ-B2. Optically, they are identical, except that this other adapter has two rings that are servo-controlled, one for color correction and another one for neutral density compensation. So this is in addition to the ND that's in the camera already. Uh, but this is servo-controlled. So this will obey, through this RCP700 protocol, 
or when you use the 4K live system, uh, it is possible to control this through that system. And don't forget the CBKDCB01. We introduced this a while ago, and this allows you to use demand controllers for either Canon or Fujinon that you can plug into the side of this nice little box. And at the top, there is a connector, and this connects to the RCP700 remote control on the back of the camera. We have the 8-pin cable, the CCA5 cable, and you're able to then control the lenses, either the Sony zoom lens, which now becomes compatible, or the Cabrio lens, or one of those B4 lenses using the B4 lens adapter using this box and the through the serial port on the camera. And because this cable can be more than 200 feet long, it means that the camera could be at the end of a crane or a jib arm or somewhere and you can still control it. So this is pretty cool because, you know, some of the rear lens controls can plug directly into the lens. So you don't, you're not always forced to use this. But the beauty of this is the, uh, we can go much longer than the typical rear lens controls can. So you can use the existing rear lens systems and demand controllers. So it have to be electronic, not the mechanical ones that we use for focus. It has to be electronic focus as well. And you can control electronic zoom focus in the iris. And you can use the RMB170 we are showing here, you have the iris knob. And uh, this little knob here on the middle can be assigned to be either focus or zoom. And all of this works perfectly. I have tested it. And of course, you know, we have a B4 Live system and all of these improvements are available through this system as well. So it is possible to control the servo for the lens adapter if you're using, uh, like in this case, uh, B4 lenses. I want to mention that we have made other improvements. We're adding false color to the uh, viewfinders, to the EL100 or the EL700. The L350 has a different processor, so it's not going to be able to deal with the false color, so it will not be able to handle that. The viewfinders, the EL100 or L700, need to come back to Sony for update. And we're not ready to do this yet. We're going to be ready very soon. So we are going to announce publicly when people can send their viewfinders to Sony for update. Uh, they need to come to the service depot to be updated. And at that time, the L700 viewfinder, when you use it via SDI, will also be able to false color. The false color for now is only applies for S-log shooting, and it will operate on both the EL100 or the EL700, as I had mentioned before. The EL700 gains, additionally, the capability of displaying pure progressive signals. So, there were several frame rates that were pure progressive that the L700 couldn't display. There were some customers, uh, rental houses, that want to be able to display any signal, and we've added that capability to the finder. False color is an exposure tool. We're used to using the waveform monitor to look at a signal, and false color converts the image to various different colors depending on how bright it is. So let's say if it's about to clip, parts of the image that are about to clip will turn red, a white clip. Parts of the image that are about to clip going black turn purple. Middle gray, which is the 50% point, is green. And so there are several levels of coloration that indicate the various different levels of the signal. So you can turn this on and you can look at the image and you can quickly know if you're overexposing or underexposing and you can see where middle gray is and where skin tone is. So this is 
pretty cool. It's a, it's a good thing. It's not perfect for every application. If you're shooting documentaries, it's very hard to see people's expression. Everything is completely different color. So documentaries, uh, the people who shoot documentaries may use it quickly to check exposure, but for running and gunning, it might not be the best thing. That little waveform monitor on the right-hand corner is quite good. And we're going to make some other improvements to it. So we've asked Japan to do some other improvements that will let us see where 100% is and where middle gray is and so on. Anyway, so it's uh, even on the waveform monitor. It's still evolving. Just want to make sure that you know that we have also upgraded the workflow tools. Uh, Raw Viewer is becoming very powerful. It is possible to control a user interface with uh, having uh, wheels. And we've added 3D LUTs to the uh, system. Just want to mention that uh, this is a very important development because color grading is pretty difficult. And these 3D LUTs that we've created are a shortcut that bring you to a very beautiful picture. And from there, you can adjust as you wish. When all of these corrections that you're making, all of these modifications that you're making to the image when you're using the application are non-destructive, you are only storing the changes, the metadata of the changes, only after you select bake and export, then whatever you export has all these changes baked in, but your originals are never changed. So this is an important thing to understand. And uh, that we have this tremendous creative control on this new set of applications. Uh, Version 2.0, we have gone over some of the major things. It adds a lot of functionality and stability to the camera and adds a lot of value to the camera. There's no other camera system in the world that can do everything this camera can. So I thank you for your patience and uh, this is pretty much the end of my presentation.